Um, but welcome everyone. Uh, this is the monthly Massachusetts Pollinator Network meeting. I'm happy to see you all. I see mostly familiar faces, but are, is anyone here for the first time? Oh, hello. Okay, yay. A few new, a few new folks. Um, well, welcome to you, a special welcome to you if you, this is your first meeting. Um, just to give a really quick overview, uh, the reason that we host these meetings is to basically have a space where people from across the state who are working on pollinator protection or interested in getting involved in that topic to come together and to exchange ideas, knowledge, information, and just to keep everybody updated on the things that are happening all across the Commonwealth. Um, yeah, and it's been, uh, it's been really exciting to get to know uh, lots of people and yeah, a lot is happening across the state. So these meetings are always very interesting. People are still coming in. So I am gonna let people continue to do that. Um, and then we're gonna break, the, the plan is to break into small groups um, where we can just have a, you know, a, a conversation, you know, do some introductions, talk about what you've been working on. And then uh, we're all gonna come back together as a group. And um, if you have particular um, uh, updates for, for the whole you know, network that you'd like to announce, uh, that would be the time to do it. So if there's something going on in your community or something that you need help with or a challenge that um, you're facing, uh, you can sort of uh, present that to the entire group and let folks know what's going on. Um, and then in the middle, kind of toward the middle of the meeting, um, we are going to hear from uh, Tim Brothers, who is the vice president of the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association, the manager of MIT's observatory. Um, and he will be talking about uh, the dark skies bills that have advanced in the legislative process, which is very exciting. Okay, it is officially 7.03. So I'm gonna create some breakout rooms. Let's sign. What people do we have? All right, I'm gonna create some rooms. Uh, and while you're there, you can just uh, you know, say your name, your pronouns, where you're calling in from, and uh, you know, kind of what brings you to the meeting tonight, or maybe something that you've been that you've been working on. Awesome. Okay, I think there's something on it in the chat. All right, I'm gonna send everyone to breakout rooms now. Hopefully this works. All right. And we'll have about do this for about 10 minutes and then come back. Oh, everyone goes. <laughs> Hello, people still here. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi there. I'm just connecting you? now, but um, I'll keep no an worries. eye when you're ready. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Hi, Isabel. I just signed in, had to move my computer, my battery went. Oh no. And I don't think I'm in the right meeting or something. No, you are, you are. We just all went to breakout rooms. I'm sorry, okay. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> there aren't just four of us. Oh, okay, I gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah, we all just went to um, breakout rooms. So let me send you somewhere. Is this your first time coming to a meeting? Or have you been uh, here no, before? No, I think it's my second, but second. I, okay. sorry about that. No, no, not, not at all. Um, and then Anne is here too. And would you like me to, oh, it says not join. That's, hmm. And if you're having trouble getting to a breakout room, let me know and I can see if I can fix it. All right, I'm gonna send you to three. All right, here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Did you get, uh, oh. Oh, yep, it worked. 
can. Love for the insect life going on. Hi, Judy. Hi. I joined Hi. um I joined the meeting on my computer that I forgot that I can't speak from that computer. Oh. So you, you know can what, do you know what room you were in? in? I'm in room three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Will send Sorry. You. No, no worries. I'll, I'll just do that. it on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have so, Did that not work? Wait, uh, did it not work for you, Judy, to get back into the room? Oh, no, it did. Hi, Beatrice. Um, if you're there, you should probably mute me, Judy. Um, if you're there, let me know and I can send you to one of our breakout rooms. We're just doing quick introductions. Oh, no worries.
I like your picture, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you know what's what is it? Is it? It's not a Cecropia moth. Is it a Cecropia moth? It's a Polyphemus moth. Polyphemus. Okay. Wow, those are some serious antennae. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm watching what the uh, live transcription just did to Polyphemus, and it's pretty funny. Oh, it's that's going to be fun to correct. <laughs> <laughs> Polyphemus. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I won't. Oh, no worries, Beatrice. We'll figure out your audio stuff. Welcome back, everyone. I don't think, I think everyone, hopefully everyone made it back and isn't lost in internet limbo. <laughs> um, well, I hope you had a nice conversation and maybe got to meet somebody new or, or learn something that's going on in somebody else's community. Um, yeah, and now I just wanna open the floor uh, for folks to share any sort of major updates that you might have or, um, any uh, requests for help that you may have from other folks or, or questions. Um, I have a couple updates too, but I wanna let other folks uh, go if, if you have something you'd like to share. So I'm Isabel Bailey from Concord, Mass. And I, I'm developing my meadow, in my backyard, um, having um, now have a more sunny with a tree gone. And, um, I don't, I'm really concerned about, I, I need more soil for the planting. I've got hardly 60 milk jugs of native seeds percolating in my backyard. Um, so I'm gonna have lots to plant, but I'm gonna need soil to add um, to the, the area. And, I'm, I, and I don't know how you, how, I don't know how to get the soil that doesn't have jumping worms and doesn't have seeds. Um, I don't, I, or, or, and doesn't have the chemicals because we have compost in the town, but that's, that's from people dropping off all of their brush and everything. And a lot of people in Concord use landscapers. So I don't, you know, I'm, a, I'm really concerned about the chemicals. And um, I don't think, I don't, I also don't trust people that will, we do have an invasive uh, plant drop off but it's always full and not everybody you know so if anybody has advice about soil i that's you know i i, I think i may go to uh wagon wheel and ask for their compost but you know I'm, it doesn't guarantee that they heat it enough and i'm willing to put it in black whatever i get in black bags and let it you know cook but i that's my problem yeah thanks isabel Anyone have a thoughts about that? Oh, Heidi, I think you're muted. Yeah, I mean, I just I use cardboard and shredded bark mulch. So I would think that would be fairly safe. I mean, in terms of keeping jumping worms out. I mean, it's not so it's not soil per se, but it's you know composted shred you know chip tree material is this is this bagged from a, a garden center i know it's um well so we have a, you know we have several local tree companies and no that's that definitely is oh, no, it's not going good. to be free of jumping worms oh, okay i just was involved in a conversation about how um chipped up trees are one of the worst vectors for jumping worms well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Sure. A, a yeah. vector like they're in. Yeah, they that they're they're the chips are very attractive to jumping worms, and oh. so Larry Cochran, who's in charge of the Northampton Community Garden, is um, saying that they're not going to allow any wood chips in the garden this year because they think that it they will all be contaminated with jumping worms. Hmm. And I'm I'm pretty, to post I, that exchange. Huh? Do you want to post that exchange from Larry or? I get, did you see it too, Anna? Yeah. Uh -huh. Post it in the chat? In the chat, I guess. Okay. I but All right. I, I heard that if you, if you bag it, if you solarize it up to like 120 degrees, 
that you'll kill the the casing the egg for the new year yeah but you have to the it's it's not so easy the the um you the bags can't have more than maybe three or four inches deep mm -hmm. that would be a lot of bags yeah and that would well, be could a you lot. use a silage tarp instead a large silage tarp or no 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 because it has to be the, the i went to this jumping worm conference at umass and mm -hmm. so now i'm all about jumping worms and it's really bad news and um there's really very little that you can do to really eliminate them completely. But they did say you could solarize in black plastic bags, but it, you know, so you could put it in black plastic bags and then put it on your asphalt driveway mm -hmm. in very hot weather. And it would have to be over 104 degrees for a pretty long time, like maybe 24 hours or longer. Yeah. But, you know, that would be, that would be quite a lot of work if you're dealing with a significant amount of soil of putting it, you know, transferring it all. And then, you know, once it's on your property, how can you, if it's contaminated, if, if you get a load of something on your property, it's going to be on the ground and there's right. going to, and if it's got any jumping worms in it, then game so, over. So what do I, what do I do for, for soil? I, 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 what I did, although it was all futile because I got jumping worms anyway, oh. I just went to, I bought bagged compost that had been, um, you know, supposedly sterile and free of jumping worms. I, I, I didn't get the jumping worms from the soil. Um, I got it. I don't know. I think I actually did get it in some wood chips. That's my theory or they came over from the neighbor's yard. But this year in my area, there was an unbelievable explosion of jumping worms. They just showed up everywhere. Where and I thought you? in West, well, in Belchertown, but it, all over the area, all over Western Massachusetts, they're okay. just everywhere. Great, man. So one yeah. of the things people have said is to just, if you, like I'm a, a trail steward, that um, you bring it in on your, on your boots. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think I'm going to have to have garden shoes first walking shoes. Yep, or they could come in on your the your tires on your car. I mean, <laughs> I, are you I, able all to I can double dig is, the dirt that's there, or you turn over to... what you have already? No, no. It, well, could she turn over the grass she has already, or? No, we'll just use what's there. No, they can they can burrow down pretty deep. No, she's wondering why why she's bringing dirt in. Why can't she needs, you... oh she needs more dirt? Yeah, the area. Do you have an area in your yard you're using that you could like put a tarp on to kill whatever's there, the grass, and use that spot after you solarize it? Well, I think if... I couldn't hear you. I think I agree. I think that's probably what I have to do. Are, are we getting a little off the topic of pollinators? Well, we, I mean, is it, this yeah. okay? We, I think there was also a question about neonics in the soil, but um, mm -hmm. I think we'll, if we'll probably let someone else um, raise a question, but if, if anyone has additional sort of thoughts or advice about that, um, you can email me and then I can relay your um feedback to, to Isabel or to everyone who's been at the meeting. Yeah. The Thanks, jumping Isabel. worm topic is very, very depressing. Sorry. It, it's a, yeah, I mean, there, I think uh, it's a, an issue that doesn't have a lot of great um, mm -mm. solutions yet. Nope. So. Mm -mm. Um, well, on a brighter subject, I've got some good news. I, uh, I had this idea a couple months ago to, I've got some town property adjacent to me that I mow with the hand, with the lawnmower. And um, I'm going to, I got permission to turn it into a meadow. That's amazing. Uh -oh. Yep. They, they endorsed that. And my only, I said, I don't need funding. I'll just do it over a series of a couple years, but I just would like you to mow it every spring, one time a year, mow it in the spring thinking they would say, yeah, sure. But they said, Oh, I have to check. I don't know if they want to commit to that. 
I'm like, it's town property. It's not even my property. Does anyone have experience with like how I can, what I can do to convince them to mow it? it what's the reasoning for not doing it? Like they think it's a, they don't have enough personnel or they don't have. Um, uh, he, he's new and he didn't know the history. And I said, and I've been here just two years. I said, well, the previous owner said he would just call and they would come and mow it. So he, and they, he just doesn't know the history, like if it's something new that they're going to be doing or. What town is it? Northboro, which is, um, you know, on the way to Worcester. Right. Um, the Freddie Gillespie has the, the big garden in, in Southboro and she and their town is really on board. And so is Marlboro. They're putting in a, a, a big garden this spring. So you might, you might con uh forgotten the person's name in Marlboro. I know, I know her. She may have it because the town really has, has supported it. Or is it like an equipment issue? Like they don't have a bush hog or what's the I just want to throw into the mix. I mean that there's no substitute for you know getting to know your local government. And, and showing up and getting in their face. <laughs> Was this piece of property donated recently? No, it's it's a future road to connect my neighborhood to the neighborhood behind me, but the road's not gonna go in because no one wants the road and it's not necessary. So, so it's, it's a right away. It's, so it's like reserve, like town property, they're not gonna sell it. It's just a, like a long strip of- An easement. On, non-native grass uh, yeah our, it's uh, we talk to our highway department when we need things mowed so i don't know but like she said your local government is your best resource since this man is or person maybe it's a woman is new um can you talk to the older the the former one and see if they can speak to this new one whoever the person is that he's replacing. There's, it sounds like there's quite a turnover. He's the, the conservation commission guys knew the, um, the guy at the DPW is only two years old. So he, the whole time he's been there, I've been mowing it. So he doesn't know, but maybe he can talk to his guys. Yeah. Whoever did it before you said somebody did it whenever the person the owner called so talk to that person and see if they can convey the message to the new person yeah uh gary how how big will the meadow be how what's the area it's about 100 feet long by 30 feet wide okay. pretty big pretty big for yeah That's but great. probably medium-sized meadow but it's pretty big for me that's awesome. Where are you getting your, your meadow mixture from? Um, I, I did a lot of seed collecting with Freddie at, at Breakneck Hill. So I, I've got lots of jugs going, like 200. Oh, wow. Um, and I've my other project in Northboro is I'm installing a pollination garden, a community pollination garden. And um, I did a big community outreach and like six, I did six workshops in the last few months. And gave free seeds. I made over a thousand pollination um, milk jugs containers. Like, so I gave everyone as many containers they wanted, as many seeds they wanted, and as much, uh, and I filled them with potting soil. So everything was free. The, the, um, the catch is each seed envelope had seeds for two envelopes, two, two uh, containers. They'll keep one and donate one back. So I've got lots of plants coming oh. for my pollination garden. And I think I'll have extra that I'll move to the meadow. Wow, that's a lot of plants. <laughs> so where did you retrieve all these milk jugs from? The town resource? I collected from Starbucks fabric? for like three months and I would make like 12 to 15 containers every day. It was, it was a lot of work. 
Yeah, good for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm still at it. I had to tri triple rinse them because it's milk and then dry them and then drill them and cut them. So you're doing winter sewing. That's great. And now he's too tired to mow. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a technical school down here where there's actually a whole landscaping program for the high schoolers. I wonder if you had no luck with the town, um, if they'd want to help you out. Um, Where's I think the town owns a lot of easements and a lot of, you know, right of ways all across, you know, the, the municipality. So probably why he couldn't just say yeah sure even though it's only one day out of a year which is reasonable but he probably didn't have the authority uh, julie where's the technical school that you mentioned oh uh, we're on the cape on the down cape. on the cape Got so it. that's in the lower cape there's also one up by the bridge by the board bridge i'm just not sure if they also have a landscaping um program Great. Well, thank you for sharing that, Gary. It's very exciting. Um, and I'm sure the logistics will, will pan out somehow. <laughs> um, we, maybe we can do one, if someone has a, a quick update, we can take one more. And then I want to uh, let Tim um, share about the dark skies bills. And then if we have time um, afterward, we can, we can come back and, and have uh, some more updates and conversations. Someone wants to put up a hand. Anna? I was wondering if it would be useful if somebody collected all the resources or the like the tough thing um, grow native and the resources where people can get good films and um, stuff like that. I did. It, it seems like there are a lot of groups out there that have lists of things that are available to people, particularly since money is a problem to get speakers and so is COVID. So uh, a lot of these films you can get either for your personal use or for group use. But I've been running into the groups and I didn't realize they were there. And then, then they have a lot of resources. So I don't know, I don't wanna dump this further work on you, Rosemary, but <laughs> I don't know what they are either it's for me to do them. When you say the films, are you talking about the different seminars? Videos and seminars and yeah, all yeah. those things. So just people have a list of places that they can look to see what they want to learn. Yeah, I know there are sort of a, a preponderance of them all of a sudden. I mean, there, there are, are like so many <laughs> different workshops and uh, which is great. I'm glad all of that is happening, yeah. um, but it can but they're yeah, all over the place. They're all over the place. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to um, know where to look. I mean, one, one thing, um, you know, uh, soon when our new website launches, which will be very soon, um, the homepage is going to have a map that lists all of the different groups that we know of in the state that are participating in the network. And if they have websites, they will be linked through that map. So you'll be able to get to the different groups' websites if they have them. Uh -huh. um, and then once people, once that map is up there, if you don't, you know, see yourself, see your group on there, obviously you should let me know so that we can add you. Could you have an asterisk or something that says we have a list of videos that are available for? Yeah, I could do that. Or um, something, whatever, however you want to do it. But yeah, just indicate that that group has resources that yeah. I can share. That's a good idea. Yeah, and Lexington Living Landscapes, I know they have right. um, like archived videos and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Great. Okay. And Green and Greenfield has some. Yes, yep. Um, excellent. Okay. Well, I'm sure folks have, have more to share and uh, we may have some more time um, toward the end of the meeting, but I am going to uh, introduce Tim. Thank you so much for being here, Tim. Uh, Tim Brothers is the vice president of the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association and the manager of MIT's Wallace Observatory. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about light pollution and its consequences for pollinators, agriculture, and the environment as a whole. Um, and then we'll conclude with simple at-home solutions and an important update on pending legislation. Thank you, Tim, for being here. Thank you, Rosemary, and, and thank you, Organic Gardeners. Uh, it's a good turnout and uh, happy to be here. So I'm gonna share my, 
Oh, I'm going to need to share my screen. Oh, Tim, let me make, make you co-host. That would help. Okay, you should be able to okay, share Okay, cool. Okay, how's that? Good to go. Okay, great. Uh, so um, usually I give a little bit longer talk. I've sort of compressed it tonight and, and geared it a little bit more towards your group. Um, so I'm going to try to get through some basics of light pollution. What is it? Just get through some of the technical terms and then we'll get to how it affects some of the issues I think you might care about. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Tim Brothers. Uh, I'm the vice president of the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. We created the chapter a few years ago because, well, while we had uh, the highest per capita membership uh, in the country in this state, uh, we didn't have a, a chapter. Uh, and the chapter has sort of allowed us to organize better, uh, talk amongst ourselves. We have a Google group, uh, monthly meetings, yearly meetings, uh, and allowed us to really organize, you know, actually moving the ball forward because one of the issues here in Massachusetts is we have some of the fastest growing light pollution issues in the country, if not the world. Uh, and so I started my, my journey in, in learning about this subject uh, because I'm, a, I'm an astronomer. That's my, I, I would say it's my day job, but really it's my night job. Uh, and what I do is I take care of MIT's observatory and located outside of Boston. It's in Westford, uh, right on the border of New Hampshire. Uh, and when I started in 2009, uh, the skies were inky black. Uh, you could see the Milky Way in, in the summertime readily, despite being, uh, you know, right along the, the 495 corridor. Uh, fast forward just a few years later, we have now lost the Milky Way. Uh, and so it, this issue is, is rapidly encroaching just about everywhere. It's particularly bad in the eastern part of the state where I live, um, but it's getting much, much worse. Uh, and so we're going to talk about, um, while it is a tough subject, you know, any of these environmental issues are, uh, we do have some really simple solutions that we, we think can actually solve it pretty quickly. Um, so uh, with that, I'm, I'm, you know, this picture uh, I, I put up here today is actually in our conservation land in Pepperell. That's where I live. It's a small town of 12,000 people uh, right on the New Hampshire border. And uh, this is probably what should be our darkest spot in the, in the town. Uh, and so, you know, the town prides itself upon its uh, rural character, as they say, um, and which is great. You know, we have a few farms left. We're trying to keep them going. Uh, we have a lot of conservation land. We have a wild and scenic uh, federally designated riverway. That's all great. Uh, but you notice that in the middle of the summer, um, when most people are up in bed uh, around 11 or 12 at night, uh, there's still an awful lot of light on the horizon. And so that's what we're going to get into here is, you know, we're, we're sort of at that threshold where we can still see some stars and there's sort of a, uh, a misconception that we, we have plenty of stars and we have plenty of time. Uh, and in fact, we don't. Um, and by the way, all of that light you see on the horizon is all from our high school, which is lit up all night long for no reason, and a, um, a grocery store that's closed at night as well. So that's just two sources, and, and that's what it does to our horizon. So let's, let's take a, a bird's eye view of the southern New England area uh, and establish what exactly are we talking about here? What is light pollution? So it's really any inappropriate or excessive use of artificial light. Uh, and really what that boils down to is if it's not useful, it's not serving its purpose, then it's energy waste. And so while it's not typically classified under climate change or, you know, any of that sort of wing of environmental protection, um, in fact, it's, it's, it's really pushing against that effort to cut carbon, cut energy, because if we're wasting light and we're missing opportunities that we have right now through efficiency gains, uh, we're wasting quite a bit. And then the secondary effects are quite devastating. Um, so if you look for, in, you know, actually pure peer reviewed information, which is important with any of these subjects, often in, in literature, it's not always referred to as light pollution. It's often referred to as artificial light at night. That's the technical term, uh, also known as ALAN or A-L-A-N. Uh, so this view here is taken from NASA. This is from their Blue Marble collection. Uh, and this shows our, um, our state and, and some areas around it. Um, I'm going to annotate one spot here. And so right about this area here, that little dot, believe it or not, 
um, that is probably pepperell right there. Uh, so 12,000 people, um, you know, we really don't have a lot of, it's not a growing town. Uh, in fact, we have stagnant growth in terms of population. Uh, we have stagnant business growth. Um, but all of these towns are sort of a similar story. You can see where the highways are. Um, you know, obviously Boston is Boston and, and New York is New York, but everywhere in between used to be a lot darker. Okay, so let's go forward and get through the nitty gritty details of what exactly are the components of light pollution. Uh, so you can have one light and have many problems from it. And this is a kind of a classic example of the Cobra Head street light that everyone grew up with. Um, typically, uh, it was a high pressure sodium, that orangey glow that we all just sort of got used to, um, that have been around since the, I believe the 50s or the 70s. And only recently have we started changing those, right? So in the last uh, about five years, we've started changing all of them out in this, in particularly in Massachusetts, uh, to LED streetlights. And LEDs are great, right? They, they save us a lot of energy. That's excellent. Uh, we can cut our, you know, energy use on these lights anywhere from 50 to 90%. That's, that's amazing. That's really good. Um, but there's been a few issues with them. And so, uh, no matter what the technology is, uh, one issue is glare. So that's when the contrasting is, is too high in a sense that it's such a bright light. Uh, it's often it's when you can see the actual element that's glowing and it blinds you from everything else around you. So it might be harder to see a kid in a crosswalk. Uh, it might be harder for a firefly to find its mate. Uh, it would make it harder um, to distinguish uh, someone breaking in if a policeman is doing his patrols, those sort of things. Then we have sky glow. That's any of the uplight that's going up into the atmosphere and bouncing back, uh, amplified by you know the, the amount of aerosols or clouds in the sky. Uh, and then we have something called light trespass. That's literally any light that's going beyond where it was designed to go. Uh, so some of that's you know going to happen. Of course, you're going to have a little backlight from the street light, um, but maybe it's excessive. Maybe your neighbor has a floodlight and they and, and they're shining it you know across their yard and it's going into your garden and it's disrupting your pollinators. So that would be trespass. Uh, and then there's a fourth thing that I'm gonna add, uh, which is maybe a little bit newer thought, um, is the color temperature. That's the color appearance. Uh, we're gonna get into what exactly that means, but essentially that's that's how the light appears. For a long time, we all got used to one color of light, right? So whether we had incandescent, it was that warm white glow, or we had the high pressure sodium, that was that sort of orangey glow. Um, and now lights come in just about every flavor you can imagine, and that actually matters quite a bit and we'll get into why uh, a little bit later. So let's go to just some really quick pictorial examples because I'm, I'm a visual person myself. So this is a really good example of glare. This was taken in Groton, Massachusetts, uh, which is a transitioning uh, rural to now suburban town uh, that's getting developed heavily. And they, they were an early adopter of, of LED streetlights. Uh, they chose very poorly shielded uh, and very high color temperature, which means a lot of blue content. And that makes the visibility uh, much, much worse. So this is a really good example of me driving home from the observatory in a, in a snowstorm. And you might not notice uh, because of the glare, but in fact, there is a crosswalk right there. And there's a crosswalk sign, although you would never be able to see anybody approaching it because uh, the amount of light is just so intense. And that has to do with we're able to see um, the, the actual element that's glowing with these LEDs as opposed to being a filament that's sort of stretched out over several inches. It's these little pinpoint lights that are, that are very hard on the eyes, especially as you get older. Uh, we have trespass. This is another example in Pepperell um, where you have an LED fixture that is mounted horizontally incorrectly, which is often done. Uh, they're supposed to be mounted, you know, pointing down at the ground. And so this business, this is a, a Walgreens, wanted their entire facade to be lit up at night. This is run 24-7. And the light, I'm standing in a neighbor's yard, so I could read a book in the middle of the night. Uh, and so that's a really good example of trespasses, is light that's going way beyond what it was intended to do, even if that purpose was silly to begin with. And uh, that's an enormous amount of energy waste. I think I calculated somewhere around 136 kilowatts wasted per year from this light alone. And then there's sky glow. So this is a, an all sky image. All sky means uh, it's a fisheye lens that we use at the observatory to see what the weather conditions are because our students have to travel from Cambridge to Westford and they wanna know what the weather is before they drive out. So um, we originally just 
bought this just as a qualitative thing to say whether it's worth driving out at night. But now we, we use it for, for light pollution monitoring. And it's been really helpful to see since we've had this up since 2013, what the changes have, have been. So if anybody's familiar with that area, Westford uh, has gone from a town, a small farm town to a town uh, size where, you know, we've added on average a strip mall per year over the last 10 years. Um, it, it's quite crazy. So that the direction that would be is in the bottom, which is in the southeast. Boston would be directly to the left. Uh, that would be east. And let's see, Groton would be uh, to, the, to the bottom right corner. Uh, and even that you can see is starting to glow. Uh, you can see New, New Hampshire in the north on the top side is much darker. Uh, so so we, we're seeing these changes and we were sort of trying to figure out, okay, well, we know they're getting exponentially faster. Um, one is why, uh, two is how do we how do we deal with that? And that's sort of where I started from the astronomy angle. And then we sort of realizing we started making connections with everybody from, you know, entomologists to agricultural specialists to uh, American Medical Association doctors and, and really started threading the, the needle with all these different parts of this fabric of, of the effects of light pollution. And, and the culprit is often uh, not just lights we're putting up at home, but uh, state subsidized lighting. Uh, so there's been these efficiency grants, sometimes called mass greening grants, different types of community grants that have uh, really pushed the LED lights because it's one of the few areas where we've made significant efficiency gains and they're really cheap to implement. So these projects can be on the order of a couple thousand to a hundred thousand and you can save towns hundreds of thousands of dollars in electricity bills, which is great. The problem is we don't really take advantage of that technology change. So often we're putting in like what you see at the library. Um, you have these globe lights that weren't there before. Sometimes they're called acorns. Um, and you'll notice that about 50% of the light at least is being wasted going up in space, serving zero purpose. Uh, the idea was to make it safer or feel safer at night when people are returning books, except that the library closes fairly early. And as far as I know, I'm the only person who's awake at night uh, at, at 12 a.m., uh, other than the police and skateboarders. So, you know, there's an awful lot of light being illuminated. Further, um, there is a pollinator garden right behind the library, and it's not just these lights. They have floodlights shining right into the gardens, which is, is, is not good. Uh, and then you have our fire station. These lights were paid for by the state. Um, they shine into people's windows. They keep them up at night. Um, they're very blue. They're very harsh. And the other problem is the whole purpose of these lights was for security. But if you look, if someone was standing right here, you would never see them because there's so much hard shadows because of the glare, right? So, you know, it sort of didn't even meet the design feature that it was supposed to achieve. And they're on all night when, like I said, no one, no one is going in and out of that spare fire station at night. So, so let's get into now quickly this color business, this color temperature. So this is really where it, we started learning more about how it's affecting biological processes. So um, I don't expect everybody to totally get everything here, but I'm going to go quickly and show you the color spectrum. So the spectrum is, is what the color content is. Um, and so the high pressure sodium is, is in the, the rainbow banded uh, spectrum. So you see a lot of the yellows and oranges, that's your eye mixes those together and you get that orange color, right? Just like painting. Uh, the, the high pressure sodium, especially the early adopters, were four or 5,000 K, uh, which is sort of like a cool white, a very significant shift in color. And the way they did that technologically is it's actually a blue LED. It's literally very, very blue. Uh, in fact, it matches this color here, you see. And then they coat the blue LED with some phosphorescent paint and it causes a reaction and you get this secondary hump here this really broad hump. So, but you'll see that the spectrum distribution is significantly different. So we've gone from a very orangey yellow kind of fire colored light to dumping a significant amount of blue, which no one really thought about at first, um, but we probably should have, right? Because we're, we're fundamentally changing the spectrum of the night. Uh, and, and furthermore, the, the night really shouldn't have light anyway, but now we've gone from a warm colored light to a blue colored light. And, and so what does that mean? And then further, it gets a little bit more complicated, right? You've probably gone to the Home Depot or Lowe's 
and you've looked at the side of the package and it has different numbers with a K after it, right? So that, that, that number in a quantitative sense describes what the color is uh, to engineers and scientists. Uh, for your purposes, the, the lights that you grew up with, the, the incandescent warm white, that's a 2700K. When LEDs first came out, they, they, those weren't available. Really, it was the four or 5,000K, and then they came out with 3,000K, and then 27. And now, really, any color you can think of, they can make. Um, but it really does matter because if you're bathing your entire community, especially if, say, you have a large farm, you have street lights next to it, uh, you want to make sure you have the right colored light, right? We know that from, you know, seed starting. Uh, certain things like that matter. Okay. So while the rest of us scientists were worried about the, the sky glow and how that type of light affects our astronomy, the medical doctors were researching it from a human health aspect. Uh, and the American Medical Association came up with a very strongly worded statement in 2016, you know, similar to, to when they said cigarettes are bad for you. Um, and they said they made some, some important initial conclusions. And this was based on not one study, but, you know, a body of evidence that this amount of blue light is particularly bad for our circadian rhythm. There was a lot of direct evidence that there was a mechanism that the blue light was somehow uh, directly flipping our clock upside down, so to speak. And they also noticed that, you know, this, this extra blue caused, seemed to appear to cause more glare, or people had a harder time seeing, especially as they got older. And so they also came up with a recommendation that said, you need to shield the lights better. Um, we're not against LEDs, we're not against efficiency, uh, but let's try to minimize the blue and shield it better, and uh, that should help. Uh, and those were sort of the initial conclusions. And so a lot of other organizations, everybody from the Massachusetts Municipal Association, Department of Energy, Massachusetts Medical Society, even the US insurance agents, even GE Lighting, who makes the darn bulbs, agreed, yes, these lights, too much blue, too much light getting into your brain, period, seems to disrupt your sleep. Okay, so that's that's where it started. And then it's quickly expanded. Um, so this is a, a diagram of your eye, and, and don't feel like you need to, to digest all of this. I'm not a doctor either. Um, but the point here is your light, uh, when you're, you're visually seeing something, you construct those images with rods and cones. Everybody probably learned that in grade school. There's this third sensor, which we only recently learned about a few years ago, called these ganglion cells. And what they do is they tell your body, they're not making images, they are sensors. And then what they're doing is looking for the intensity of the light in the room and how much blue content. And so the purpose is to, to tell your brain what time it is. And if your brain knows what time it is, it knows when to secrete different hormones. And one of those important critical hormones is melatonin. When melatonin is suppressed, um, a whole bunch of functions, and, and by the way, th this is not just humans, this is animals as well. So I think you see where this is going. So when your melatonin is being suppressed, you're going to want to, for example, eat late at night. Uh, that's going to increase your likelihood of obesity, heart issues, uh, increase your likelihood that you're not going to sleep right. And, therefore increase your likelihood of mental health disorders. Um, so all of your basic primal functions are governed by this clock. And if it's flipped upside down, that's a major problem. And what's the mechanism? Well, the brain is the mechanism because it's a hitting, you know, it's, it's the light, but you know, why exactly does that happen? Well, it turns out we, those receptors, uh, this is just sort of bad luck here. The circadian sensitivity happens to be in the blue. And it just so happens those blue LEDs fit like a key in a keyhole. And so they match perfectly. They have a, an enormous propensity to disrupt that melatonin. Um, notice how the, the, the circadian sensitivity is way bluer than the photopic. Photopic is how you form images. So those are the rods and the cones to the right. And those are centered in the green. Now, one thing they did, this was a really novel experiment. They took a blind man and they monitored the melatonin in his blood. And first they shown, so his rods and cones did not work, but his ganglion cells did. And so they shown a green light and then a blue light in his eyes, and they could directly see that the blue light definitely suppressed the melatonin. So this is one of the, the key pieces of evidence that sort of sealed the deal to say, okay, we're seeing these effects and now we can prove that there's actually a real physical mechanism to do this. So 
okay, so why would our eyes be built this way? In fact, most creatures have this feature, not all, but, but many, and, and part of it is an evolutionary trait. Um, blue light happens to be one of the few wavelengths that filters through the top layer of the ocean. And so it dates back all the way back to, to primordial sea creatures. So this light doesn't just affect humans, it affects birds too. Uh, millions of birds every year are confused and they fly into buildings. Uh, this is a major issue. Um, sea turtles, uh, amongst many other um, turtles, uh, but sea turtles in particular have been known to beach themselves. This was a huge issue in Florida for the past several years. They've now that and we realize what's going on, they've actually have significant regulations for areas like my, Miami. Um, so that the, the turtles, what was happening is they were interpreting the seacoast as the stars and the moon. They were trying to follow the things that they always used to follow. And instead they're following what's on the ground and they were going and beaching themselves and then not reproducing or not surviving because of predation. Uh, we have Atlantic salmon uh, amongst several other fish uh, that uh, it doesn't disrupt their melatonin, but it does disrupt their mating and their other biological functions, uh, decreasing their population. So these are important food sources. These are important pollinators. They're important creatures that form part of our food web. Uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So let's get into to agriculture now. Um, so this is one of the early uh, papers in 2017 that was really important um, by Ava Knopp. And so what this did was establish that there's this that we knew you know obviously we knew about pollinators so there's uh, direct and indirect relationships between them there's nocturnal pollinators there's diurnal pollinators but really we we wanted to try to figure out what's going on with these nocturnal ones particularly you know there's a small percentage of bees i think it's like one percent of bees are nocturnal but moths and and, and butterflies and some other ones uh, do a significant uh, amount of pollinating in in the night and those are important uh, to a variety of, of types of um, fruits and vegetables. So the thing that they found was that uh, when they were illuminated, so when they were bathed in light, uh, there was 62% fewer nocturnal visitations to those illuminated sites, which resulted in 29% fewer species at those illuminated sites, and therefore a 13% reduction in yield. So, you know, in an era where we're sort of concerned about food supply, people growing their own food, this is something we need to think about, especially as I see a lot of people putting solar lights in their gardens. Uh, and to put in perspective, if you're just concerned about cost, which often policymakers are, uh, the economic value of pollination was somewhere around 361 billion. And, you know, that was over 10 years ago. But then we start expanding beyond that, that field. Um, in that initial crop, we start looking at the whole ecosystem. So not only does the light um, disrupt the pollinators, the plants themselves, but it also attracts bugs, bugs you don't want. So you're, you're now moving populations in that you don't want, you're moving populations out that you do want, and you have a really bad feedback cycle. So some of the other, um, for example, the other pro, um, crops that have been affected that they've documented, particularly soybeans, because it's such a heavy, uh, important crop uh, to, to many nations, uh, maize or corn, uh, young cassava plants. Um, and the thing that they've observed in abundance of are slugs in particular. Uh, this research is, is really, I think, fascinating uh, because fireflies are a little different. Uh, they actually are not as affected particularly about the blue light, but they're just affected in general by, by too much light in a general sense. Um, and this research is actually heavily being uh, done in the state of Massachusetts, uh, mostly out of Fitchburg State and Tufts University. Uh, and in, in fact, Mass Audubon now has a firefly counting program uh, to try to make sure that we, we don't lose our, our fireflies. Um, and so you may have seen the headlines, um, and this one's sort of typical, right? Because the, the uh, I think this might have been from NPR, um, posted it and they said, the top threats are habitat loss, pesticides, and light pollution. But if you actually read the study, uh, the order of how important each of those things are in terms of what they're doing, the, the biggest issue for fireflies is habitat loss, 
So that's people disrupting, say, overdeveloping, uh, disrupting, say, a rotten log where they like to put their larvae and the larvae needs to sit there for a year or two before it's ready. Uh, light pollution turns out to be the number two cause of their demise. And that is ahead of pesticides, which shocked a lot of people. Uh, so it, it, th these are important indicators. I realize this is not a traditional uh, pollinator by any means, but it's something we, we need to start thinking out of the box and actually study these things because, uh, as you may have heard, um, there's this thing apparently called the insect apocalypse. Uh, this has been widely reported in a lot of papers. It's a controversial hyperbolic statement. Uh, I think it means well. I, I think it's still, you know, the jury's out on whether that is true. Uh, but we definitely see ins insects and pollinators in particular uh, declining, right? I think we all know that for sure. Uh, and one of the great things that's been done in particular by Avalon Owens, who, who is a Tufts researcher, um, is, is sort of really pulling all of these different papers together and documenting it and saying, we have a really global problem. It's not just one species or another. Uh, each of these species, and they all play off of each other, of course. Um, you know, if, if one of these plants isn't being pollinated, then there's not going to be fruit, not just for humans, but for the daytime pollinators who also do work. Uh, so you, you have this terrible cycle of, of disrupting all of these creatures, um, mating, eating, and pollinating. And that's why you're starting to see population collapses. So you've disrupted all the different legs of, of, of their biological function. Uh, and then this is, you may have seen some of these pictures before, um, and this might sort of look neat, um, but it's an indicator of, of the issue. So this is a soybean field, uh, I believe in Nebraska. Uh, and you see the street lights on the left with the highway, and you can see there's some areas of, of green, and that's actually the um, soybeans. Um, they are delayed maturation late in the season. They're flowering late. Uh, they're not very useful. And so much so that the farmers in this area learn that they need to put their greenhouses about 50 yards away from the lights or, or you know, not much is going to grow. Uh, and so that has to do with, you know, it doesn't mean you can't have lights there, uh, but if they are designed a little bit better, they had a little bit better shielding, um, you could probably get away with it or maybe you dim them. Uh, so what can you do? Um, well, for one, don't do this. Uh, this is popping up everywhere, um, all over the world. Uh, there's been a few cases I know in Shirley. This was one. Uh, Chelmsford was another. These are LED grow houses. Um, these are for everything from lettuce to tomatoes to marijuana. Um, and not to say they can't exist if that's how you choose to grow. But uh, the problem is if you don't have regulations to govern um, the shielding on these, this is one greenhouse. And this is from a town away and it turned the whole sky purple. And we, we could actually see this from the observatory and we, we had no idea what was going on. We thought it was fireworks. Um, it was because this greenhouse started up and no one bothered to sort of write a site plan for it. And, and we solved the problem. They, they were forced to put shields on uh, little curtains that retract at night. Um, but you know, these are, this, this is an issue that's happening all over the world. And it's something to be aware of as, as people shift to uh, this mechanized farming. Uh, something you can do is before you install lighting, think about what you're what you're putting up. So uh, the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, uh, has some really great graphics. Um, so you know I know it can be confusing going to the hardware store if you're putting up a new uh, security light or a door light or a barn light. Um, just buy one that's fully shielded. Buy one where there's no light going upward. Make sure you orient it correctly so it's pointed down. Uh, choose a color temperature below 2700K, so warm white or, or warmer. Um, and, and if you can buy one with shields, you know, floodlights are difficult, difficult, but at least if you have a floodlight, try to point it downward. Try to use a lower wattage. So um, even if you can't do the shielding, even choosing a bulb half as large uh, can make a pretty significant difference. And honestly, you're going to see better anyway. Uh, the other thing is help us pass this dark sky bill. So, so what is this? Um, Folks in Massachusetts have been trying for almost 30 years to pass an outdoor lighting uh, legislation. Uh, we are the only state in the Northeast that does not have one. And in fact, um, just a few weeks ago, Nevada, home of Las Vegas, passed theirs. So we are, we are in poor company at this point. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think if Texas can do this, we can probably do it up here. 
Um, but we've had quite a hard time with the legislature, as I, as I know many environmental bills have. Uh, but good news, uh, this session we are faring a little bit better. Uh, we are now, we are past, the, so there's two identical, you notice there's two identical bills here, but with different numbers. And the reason for that is the Senate and the House file their own bills, and they sometimes go on their own journey. Uh, that makes things a little bit more complicated, but right now the Senate version was voted on favorably uh, just a couple weeks ago, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, it is now being evaluated in the Ways and Means, which are sort of like the budget number cruncher folks. Um, the House version has been held up. Um, we've got an extension. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, but there is a large climate environmental bill being planned. Um, there is talk that our bill might be bundled with that, which would be, you know, if that's how it needs to pass, so be it. Um, but so it's still in the Telecommunications Utilities and Energy Committee for now. And um, what we need is folks to contact their state rep and state senators, um, ask them to co-sponsor it, ask them to push for it in each of these committees. Um, and and that's that's basically what we need to do. We need to just keep the pressure on them uh, and try to get this bill passed and passed identically. So, you know, with two different journeys, you have to be really careful with bills. I don't know if you've been through this before. If there's one word that's different and it's not taken care of in the final reconciliation, uh, the bill gets often slashed and it gets cut out. Um, so the four things that it would do, uh, and this is only publicly paid for lighting. So this is state funded, town funded, municipally funded, um, but not things you do in your own home, not things that Walmart does, if that makes sense. Uh, so it would limit uh, these, these state publicly funded lighting uh, from, from going over 3000 K. So we're gonna match the American Medical Association recommendations. Uh, it would actually limit up light by requiring shielding. It would actually force um, new lighting to not go over uh, the minimums that are, are um, often specified in these, these uh, rule books um, that often are not being followed. So we're actually setting limits in the amount of light we can put in the environment. Uh, it would force the state uh, to create a policy and, and do some studies on, on, you know, do we even need these lights? For example, on a rural road, why do we have lights? Well, the, the answer is um, because it helped keep the power companies going in the middle of the night in the 70s. Um, there's a reason why towns and cities haven't added street lights since the 1970s. Um, we don't really need them. And especially at lower speeds, uh, they really don't do much because we have really good headlights now. Uh, so if you go to Europe, a lot, of, a lot of roads have reflectorized roadway markers, for example. And that's what we want the state to study. And that's where we can really start making some inroads on cutting carbon. And the final piece, this is probably the most attractive to legislators. And this is something I knew nothing about and most people don't, is that there's something called a tariff structure. And what it does is it says uh, the power company, let's say National Grid, for example, uh, can charge you whatever they want for unmetered lighting uh, within reason. And so, for example, a street light, uh, maybe they say, somewhere between 25 and 50 watts, we'll charge you 25 watts. The problem with that is that LED streetlights, because they are so efficient now, we're now in single digits. Let's say they're operating, for example, in Pepperell at eight watts right now. We're still getting charged 25 watts. So we're essentially subsidizing utility companies and we're all paying for that. And what that does in turn is it disincentivizes towns from utilizing this little device that comes with all these LED street lights, which is this little smart controller that you can actually set what the brightness is. And so when towns, you know, they get it paid for by the state, they get it installed and they just leave it at full brightness because they figure, well, I'm not saving any money. Why bother dimming it? Well, the, the, the trick with LED lights is that you only need about a third to a half of the brightness. So instead of turning it down to where it should be, they're operating at full blast, making light pollution worse to help out the power company, when really we should be using less and recouping that money for our communities. So I'm gonna end there with those questions um, and I'd be happy to answer what you have. Thank you, Tim. I was very, very informative. I, I, very informative and um, those bills are really important. Do you, is, my first question actually, and then I'll let, let others ask a few questions, um, 
is do you have a letter campaign set up so that folks can send an like a an email to their legislator um, um yeah so that, that's a great question so one thing we found uh with legislators is because nowadays everything is electronic they're getting a lot of form letters and they're not reading them and i highly recommend people writing their own letters even if it's a one-liner saying i support this bill you put your name you put your address and and you could say because i care about pollinators or because i care about the stars um when we've tried doing the the you know the pre-made letters um they they tend to get mad at us um this happened actually just this weekend with sierra club i uh, had a big letter writing campaign and and one legislator in particular got i think about a thousand and he wasn't super thrilled um i think that's ridiculous personally but i would say you know write your own letter from your own heart and 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 i think it'll it'll matter probably a bit more Do you folks have other questions? We'll adjourn in just a few minutes, but mm. go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, so uh, where I live, there's a municipal building across the way. And um, I've actually talked to, um, is it James Lowenthal who works at Smith yes. College? Um, so, you know, he suggested the people I should reach out to us so I talk to the one of the building um, staff people and he said he said he you know he commented oh well since a resident is complaining about the light coming from this building I think the process will be faster but he claimed back in this it should have been remedy back in December and I think they've replaced two lights but there's still like three that are just, they're like floodlights coming into our front door every night. And so I don't know if you have any ideas of how to kind of move the process faster. Should I take a picture at night and kind of yeah. send it to them and say, this is what it looks like at night? What town do you live in? I'm in Northampton. Oh, you're in Northampton. Okay. So I actually grew up in Southampton. Um, so what I would say is, yes, pictures are worth a thousand words. And whoever he recommended, you know, James knows he lives in Northampton, um, I, I would go with. But if you're not getting action, I, I'm a big fan of just escalating things. And so I would, you know, if you're not getting a response, send it to the, the city council and mm -hmm. say, you know, my if you feel like your sleep is being disrupted and, and you've got a picture of shadows in your yard from this light, take the picture, send it to him. You know, um, you don't get anywhere, write an editorial, you know, in the Gazette. Um, and because I mean, you have a right to sleep, right? I mean, uh, I think that's that's a human right, <laughs> and and I would take that approach. And you know, I've had similar luck with things like they put a light, National Grid put a, a light in a ridiculous place next to an area where Blanding's turtles, which are an endangered species, uh, spawn in Pepperell, one of the few towns that have them. And so, you know, I wrote a brief to them, and within a couple of weeks, the light was was taken down. Um, so, you know, use whatever. You know, there's we we can help you certainly. IDA and, and James is a good resource for that. Um, okay. Yeah, I can say they I love they try to they try to illuminate a whole parking lot with you know <laughs> two lights that are beam you know beaming across. Like oh my god, yeah, that's crazy. <clears throat> right. uh, Carol, and then maybe we can take one more if there is one. Um, I just have a quick question. I heard you present before and it was fantastic and this was also fantastic and um i sent out an email after you spoke to my homeowners association encouraging people to turn off their lights at night but we do have street lights and we have a neighbor directly across from us who keeps their lights on all night long their outside lights and um it's very it's very annoying and they've been spoken to but i'm wondering if you have any literature like handouts that um you that we could print out um, I go around to my whole neighborhood and hand out a flyer or something if you have some, had something like that. Yeah, so uh, darksky.org uh, is, is our parent organization, the International Dark Sky Association. Um, they have a lot of free information. I mean, they have a, I know there's a, even a section on the front of the page, how to talk to a neighbor. Um, and we do have lots of pamphlets. So uh, what, what town do you live in? I also live in Northampton. 
Okay. Uh, so, so both of you should talk to, to James Lowenthal. I'm sure he has, you know, we all have boxes. I, I live in central mass, so I would be too far for you, but, um, you know, he works at Smith college. He's an astronomy chair there. And, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to give you some pamphlets, uh, to hand out. And, you know, I know that he's worked hard on, you know, the bylaw in Northampton. Um, that's one of the issues is that local regulations often dictate what happens at, at this granular level. Um, I have been writing for Pepperell and a few other towns, sort of a general bylaw that would handle a lot of these issues. So I'd be happy to share it with you as well. Um, and, and we're gonna be updating that on our website soon, but I, I can email you a copy where it's at right now. Um, that would I'll help. I'll put my know. email in the chat. Fair enough. Okay. And I could work with you, Jessica. Yeah, he has another group, like a local group called, I think it's Northampton City Lights or something like that, um, that helps more on the local Northampton level. Um, Jessica and Carol, if you want, someone wants to email me, then I can, I can connect the two of you. Oh, never mind. There's Carol's email. Jessica, do you have Carol's email? Yes, thanks. Okay. Thanks, cool. Carol. Awesome. Tim, I do uh -huh. astrophotography. Um, in fact, I used to be a member at Atmob just down the street from where you work, that the farmhouse right there. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. And actually, you know, now that you mentioned Atmob, so there is a large 40 unit, 40B um, development that is going to be going in literally, you know, a thousand feet from the Atmob clubhouse um that we just found out about they, they did we were butters they did not notify us and um could significantly impact um not just uh the astronomy and, and you know outreach that mob does but also there's a lot of endangered species on the property so what i should have mentioned this earlier mit owns a protected piece of land on the order of 1300 acres uh which is sort of unheard of um that has a lot of you know important species of plants and and, and animals um that were we're concerned with with this kind of development so you know be sure to, to get involved where you can is that uh, i see your hand anna uh, is that contiguous property that that they own yes okay wow. yeah it, it's across four towns uh groton dunstable tingsboro um and westford okay interesting uh i didn't know that uh anna you had a question i our whole town is uh regulated agricultural and we're a very small town way out in the country so we have basically no light pollution except for the mercury lights from barns which are basically not very useful uh, so i was wondering if uh, what their pollution rate is and if we should be concerned about them i i don't like them because they're light but other than that i don't know well, I mean, I, I think any of those older generation lights are not as efficient as LED, right? So, so you're, you're definitely burning more carbon to make those lights happen. Uh, they can be really harsh in the eye. If I remember what those mercury lights look like, I haven't I don't, I don't see too harsh. many of them anymore. Yes, they're bright. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty harsh in the eye. Yeah, so, um, you know, the good news is, you know, a lot of lights are easily re replaceable now. Um, the, the important thing is, you know, a lot of times people just don't realize, right? So let's say it's a you know, you talk to a farmer with that hideous, you know, metal halide or, or mercury light that's on the side, and you just talk to them and you, you start up a conversation and say, well, you know, maybe you can't afford to replace it, but can you at least shield it? Could you turn it off? And turn it off, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oops. I think Tim is frozen. frozen. <laughs> um, Night, um, you know, it's bothering me. Yeah, do something that's a little bit more directed. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. I, I think um, so. We're past eight fifteen, so I think we're gonna sign off. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Um, I just have to say, uh, I have a um, seven, almost eight year old who's like really into space, and it makes me super sad that when we go outside, it's hard to see much of anything. Um, so all every most of what he knows about space is coming from pictures and books, and not from his his own eyes. So I um, I hope that your campaign is successful and I hope everyone here supports it as much as we well, can. Thank you so much for having, having me. And, and I, you know, I know this, this environmental stuff can be a little uh, depressing sometimes, but I will give you a little, uh, well, a little boost here and that 
some of the towns across the country that have experimented with with dimming the streetlights and putting the correct bulbs like I was talking about have actually seen a restoration of their skies. Um, Pepperell, which now has the most environmentally friendly lighting for our streetlights in the country, uh, we will know in this next year how much of a difference it made, um, but we actually reduced the amount of blue even from the high pressure sodium. So, so the, you know, the answers are here, we have the technology, it's totally solvable, and we still saved 80% of our electricity. So um, you know, it, we can do this. I think it's the message you should leave here with. It's a winning solution. <laughs> thank you, Tim. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, our next meeting is March 29th. We're having sort of two in this month because February was so short. Uh, so I hope to see you all, you all there. All right, have a great night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>